Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody from India. It's uh, 12 30 here. Uh, our first speaker today is Dr. Sarunas uh, Ponkins. Uh, he is Associate Professor, Digital, Mid uh, Digital Culture, Communication, and Media Research Group, Faculty of Social Sciences, Arts, and Humanities, Kong's University of technology. And the title of his uh, talk is Surveillance, Capitalism and Platform uh, Economy in India Towards Neoliberal Transhumanism. So I welcome Dr. Sarunas and I would humbly request you to start uh, uh, to start presenting his paper. And Dr. Sarunas, the whole stage is all yours. And uh, one thing I would like to mention that uh, we would try to uh, wrap up this lecture within half an hour and another 10 minutes will be given for question and answer session. Okay, so uh, so in so it, it, it stands that uh, you'll be given 40 minutes in total. But thank you. I welcome you again. Please. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm really glad uh, to be here and to present my paper. Uh, so as uh, it was mentioned, uh, the title of it is um, Surveillance Capitalism and Platform Economy in India Towards Neoliberal uh, Transhumanism. Um, so um, on April 4th, uh, 2022, uh, India's uh, Lok Sabha, the lower house of parliament, uh, passed the controversial criminal procedure identification bill, allowing the police to collect biometrical data of all who are arrested or detained irrespective if they are subsequently charged or not. Such legislation simplifies the collection and storage of biometrical data, which according to critics violate uh, privacy. Uh, the critics of this bill also claim that this would be um, yet another step in collecting information about um, dissenters, government opponents, as well as minorities, Muslims in particular, and keeping them under close watch. Um, such fears are based on the controversy surrounding Aadhaar, a biometrical identification system launched in 2009. Uh, reports suggest that um, state governments in Gujarat, Telangana, and Andhra Pradesh, without the people's knowledge, collected and stored biometrical as, whether, as well as other personal data, raising concerns about privacy, potential misuse of this data, as well as its security when such data is stored in databases that are not impossible to breach. Um, Criminal Procedure Identification Bill is the latest step in expanding the digital surveillance apparatus of the state, uh, which once again confirms the extent to which um, India's government is invested in digitalizing the relationship between the state and its citizens. This also adds yet another layer to an already complex platform ecosystem in India, encompassing different aspects of life from biometrical identity cards and online payments to digital entertainment. The analysis of such complexity uh, exposes um, the intimate relationship between the state and the corporate sector in extracting the data from 1.3 billion Indians for reasons ranging from profit to state surveillance. Um, in this paper, digitalization means several interconnected uh, issues. On the one hand, uh, it instrumentalizes datafication and collection of uh, behavioral data. On the other, um, it reflects a general global tendency of existential duality, where we all must have an actual and a digital self, where the digital self is owned for different reasons by the corporate sector and the state. Such um, quote-unquote owning, or what Maurizio Lazzarato terms as machinic enslavement, um, came to India in stages, and uh, this process uh, largely can be traced back to the 1990s and the economic liberalization policies. In any case, digitalization realizes the dreams of both state and the corporate sector in surveilling the population and actualizes what um, Shoshana Zuboff terms as uh, surveillance capitalism. One of the defining uh, features of surveillance capitalism is claiming um, that, quote, human experience as free raw material for hidden commercial practices of extraction, prediction, and sales, end quote. 
if in the times of what Zubov terms um, as a first modernity, a pre-digital, pre-neoliberal capitalist configuration, the extraction pointed towards the exploitation of raw natural resources, currently the most prized raw material is behavioral data. Such form of extraction, as uh, Metzadra and uh, Nielsen, for example, point out, in terms of its logic, is no different from the extraction of natural resources. And uh, cuts, quote, through patterns of human cooperation and even trespassing on the very sinews of the human body, end of quote. What is of value in this case is uh, not us as customers, but squarely what we do online, how we navigate the digital space. Because whatever we do, we leave a digital footprint, which precisely is the behavioral data. Uh, behavioral data extraction, in the words of Graham Murdoch, uh, has helped these corporations as well as states to create our digital doubles or doppelgangers and own them. I argue that the extent, extensive usage of digital technologies in extracting data results uh, data results in a peculiar creation of us as neoliberal transhumans. Mm, I'd like to start unpacking this by giving another example. In 2018, um, India's government announced um, Digi Yatra, uh, which was implemented last year, a digital passenger processing facility at selected airports in India based on facial recognition technology. Anyone can download an app, link it with a government authorized identity proof and travel without a need to interact with any airport employees in order to um, enter secure areas or board a flight. Uh, one concern, obviously, is the data privacy. But uh, more than that, as um, different scholars demonstrate, the facial recognition technology is inherently flawed as it can be biased, for example, regarding the, the skin color or gender, because the humans that created it are biased, as, as again, various scholars have demonstrated um, in many instances. Would the algorithms that make such technology possible be able to read people uh, with darker skin tones. Already there have been many controversies related to, to this problem where in some cases, um, faces with darker skin tones are not recognized or in some where they are categorized by the AI, not as humans. This depends of course on what kind of data is used to train the algorithm to work effectively, uh, which essentially means that the problem lies with the human who, for example, is using only images of people, people with lighter skin tones to train, to train the algorithm in facial recognition and not with the machine. Which data will be used in India to train the Digiatra algorithms? Um, we do not know. But the bottom line is, uh, this points towards a different type of enslavement as well. Mm, uh, such system of surveillance capitalism um, enslaves not only humans, but also the um, the technological and the non-human entities, um, devices, um, software, algorithms, AI, uh, and, and so on. Um, and these devices are in the service of multinational uh, corporations and governments. We must therefore acknowledge that what the digitalization at, and the platformization efforts in India have um, ultimately created um, is a complex ecosystem of um, human and non-human agencies, uh, which produces yet another capitalist avatar, a neoliberal transhuman. The best illustration of such phenomena um, are extensive platform, um, uh, platform ecosystems through which and uh, with which we interact in our social life on a daily basis and which are designed to collect, analyze, and store our data. Um, this data is not only a prized raw material for the corporations to use, but a digital construct of our own selves, a partial, distorted, incomplete, but for the algorithms as well as for the human entities analyzing them, these digital reflections are us. How did we arrive at this situation, specifically in India? In order to understand these processes, we must um, first look at two important events. Uh, one is the introduction of Aadhaar, a digital ident uh, biometrical identity system. Um, and the second uh, is government's uh, Digital India initiative. 
This is the precise moment where out of political, economic, and technological collision, such new form of existence emerges. Um, the overall origins of um, surveillance capitalism in India um, can be traced to the introduction of Aadhaar, uh, biometrical identification platform for all citizens. Um, Indian government launched it hoping that uh, biometrical identification would help in its devel developmentalist project, uh, especially in helping the rural populations to access the state's welfare schemes. I won't go into the details um, regarding the Congress government's rationale behind it and um, as it's beyond um, today's uh, topic. Uh, what the state was seeking with Aadhaar was the certainty of identity. In theory, even if a person's name is spelled differently in various documents or the date of birth is uncertain, fingerprints and iris are unique properties a person possesses. Additionally, such system helps to isolate one particular person with absolute certainty to collate biometrical data with other types of information and to draw conclusions about the person's preferences, as well as likes and dislikes that extend across the full spectrum of social life. One needs to link at her number if one wants to get a mobile phone number, or order lunch on Zomato, or buy books on Amazon. The correlation of such data may say a lot about a person, and the collection and analysis of such data produces a digital double, or perhaps we can even term this um, as a digital other. Deleuze, by looking at the mutations of capitalism in late 20th century and stating that um, capitalism is no longer engaged in production but metaproduction, coined a term individual, which um, indicates a fundamental shift in individuality and in the concept of the self. Hence, perhaps we can claim that in the process of metaproduction, an extreme variant of individuality emerges, which resembles us, but ultimately it is not. It is something produced and owned in the process of metaproduction. Adhar, uh, from the beginning, was a surveillance project, and from the very inception saw a strong bonding between the state and the corporate sector, uh, which built the system. Um, in particular, Infosys, uh, the leading technology corporation in India, which largely is behind the infrastructure uh, on which Adhar is built. At the time of writing, 92% of India's population is registered with Aadhaar, but also quite contentiously, um, different digital platforms use Aadhaar for customer identification, including Microsoft and Meta, which means that these corporations gain access to a vast database, a real treasure trove in the times of surveillance capitalism. By exploiting this data or our digital selves, the corporations can ma manipulate the users or actual selves by offering personalized experience of the digital world uh, that can take many forms. These can include individually tailored advertising based on our previous choice uh, and also a personalized experience of social networking platforms. Uh, let's turn to another major event. In 2015, the government launched its flagship program termed um, Digital India uh, with a vision, um, quote, to transform India into a digitally empowered society and knowledge economy, end of quote. Part of its vision is, quote, cradle to grave digital identity that is unique, lifelong, online, and authenticable to every citizen, end of quote. These quotes are from the Digital India official website. Um, it is a complex and multi-layered program um, of state-run digitalization involving uh, uh, different aspects from providing internet connectivity even in the remotest parts of the country through a network of optical fiber cables to promoting digital cashless payments. Thus began the second stage of digitalization, very swiftly followed by um, demonetization in 2016, uh, which saw the introduction of unified payments interface or UPI platform allowing digital payments for a wide variety of goods and services by simply using a smartphone linked with the bank account through Aadhaar identification system. UPI allows <clears throat> instant bank transfers by using a mobile phone and without knowing the bank details of the transacting parties. Furthermore, it is the Aadhaar system that is at the core of digital India and UPI. This creates a digital footprint that, in theory, can be exploited by the parties who gain access to it. 
One year after the introduction of Digital India Initiative on November 8, 2016, uh, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced an overnight demonetization, a withdrawal of 500 and 1,000 rupee notes, which comprised over 80% of the currency notes in circulation at the time. Together with this move, a shift towards digital payments working through UPI was promoted by a platform called Bharat Interface for Money or BEAM, uh, managed by National Payments Corporation of India. This move caused um, shock and panic on the grassroots level uh, as large sections of the society kept their savings in cash and were not able to swiftly shift towards digital payments due to the infrastructural constraints. Uh, the government clearly was pushing digital financial services. Um, what were the motives um, of demonetization? Um, initially, as the PM Modi outlined in his announcement, to tackle counterfeit banknotes, uh, terrorism financing, corruption, and the illegal economy. Um, however, there was a shift in rhetoric soon after, and in his speech on December 25th, um, Prime Minister Modi was emphasizing cashless agenda and digitalization. Who benefited from, demonetiza from the demonetization? Arguably, banks and the fintech sector, especially companies offering digital wallets like um, Paytm, um, Zest Money, Lazy Pay, and so on. Hmm. These events in 2015 and 2016 uh, point towards an orchestrated attempt um, by the government and the corporate sector to aggressively introduce um, digitalization for different auto-connected reasons. For the government, the digital footprint helps to track and surveil the population with the aim of uprooting any potential dissent. For the corporate sector, the digital footprint offers access to 1.3 billion potential customers. With large sections of society being on the other side of the digital divide, Digital India Initiative, demonetization and cashlessness were means to initiate India into um, surveillance capitalism, a form of capitalism with a uh, unique logic of accumulation in which surveillance is a foundational mechanism in the transformation of investment into profit, according to Shoshana Zubo. Um, demonetization can be understood as a necessary neoliberal shock for the market, not unlike earlier shocks elsewhere in the world, prompting, prompting the market to solve the crisis the market itself creates. Uh, Naomi Klein uh, terms this as a shock doctrine and disaster capitalism, which treats disasters as exciting market opportunities. Milton Friedman, a Nobel Prize winning economist and one of the principal architects of neoliberal doctrine, coined a term economic shock treatment to demonstrate the positive impact economic shocks have, brushing aside the immense human suffering that they bring. No wonder then that the push towards digitalization in India over the past decade was possible only by um, artificially engineering the shock, causing mass upheaval in the country and paving the road for the solutions conjured, conjured by the market itself, from digital payments to online video streaming platforms to the emergence of um, various forms of digital labor. So digital India, as well as demonetization, were um, integral processes of gradual but rather swift machinic enslavement enacted in India. The reliance on technology and the digital world was steadily growing and simultaneously the amounts of data produced in the process. This, is, this was also a classical example of metaproduction, a shock with the aim to forcefully push large sections of society online so that the process of conjuring of the digital selves could be immensely stepped up. Um, in India, the tendencies <clears throat> of the alignment of technological innovations, um, neoliberal economy and political elites can be seen since early 1990s, but more for forcefully uh, since 2015. Um, the adoption of Adar is a clear manifestation of surveillance capitalism, as is the Criminal Procedure Identification Bill and Digiatra I mentioned earlier. Um, such crackdown on civil liberties must be seen as integral part of digital India, an entanglement of the state and the corporate sector in surveilling the population, but also in extracting data uh, out of which um, our digital selves could be created. 
Um, everybody wins in this process, both the government or governments, as it is obviously a global phenomenon, and the corporations. Everybody except us, that is, ones that are perhaps outside the structures of power. Um, in this mechanism, we can see glimpses of what uh, Lazzarato refers to as machinic enslavement, mode of control and regulation that replaces human slavery with one that is assisted by technology. In the case of digitalization, uh, the machinic enslavement works through um, varied mechanisms of desire production, especially when it comes to entertainment platforms, by providing us the content that is precisely right for us, thanks to the algorithm that studies our behavior. Such mechanism is a platform, from Adhar to Amazon, from WhatsApp to Uber, the variety of platforms um, with which we constantly interact that help us and through which we exist is immense. They also create an aura of extreme efficiency, especially the, the platforms that help us in getting things done quickly, whether it is booking a cab on Ola, lunch on Zomato, a plumber on Urban Company, or simply finding the right information on Google. However, as Zuboff argues, a quote, under this regime, the precise moment at which our needs are met is also the precise moment at which our lives are plundered for behavioral data, end of quote. And precisely this is how the machinic enslavement works in this case, through the invisible surplus extraction. The invisibility of such act um, is very important. It signals a deep saturation of life with media, and indicates the invisibility of media. In 21st century, increasingly we live in media, that is, uh, media becomes an ontological anchor for us to an extent that we no longer notice its presence. In this way, media's grip over our existence is far more profound than ever before. Given that media in 21st century is entirely subsumed by the surveillance capitalism, by extension, we can claim that surveillance has become an integral part of our everyday life existence to the point that we no longer have any capacity to perceive it and hence to resist its control. This helps in creating the image of technological benevolence and aids in strengthening the positive image of the government that grants technological enlightenment to the people. Platform becomes an extension of the human and in a way helps us to transcend our pre-platform human existence, which was less efficient, less free, more clumsy, and perhaps more boring. Platform infrastructure, in short, improves the human on many levels. There is um, also another problem that we can tackle. Uh, machinic enslavement by surveillance capitalism captures not only human subjects, uh, but also the non-human ones. Therefore, media technologies, while having the revolutionary potential to re liberate us, in the words of Zubov, from the predicament of second modernity, must be seen as equally enslaved by the system. As platform economy heavily relies on um, artificial intelligence algorithms in extracting behavioral data, the system of surveillance capitalism inadvertently molds a new type of assemblage, a human machine one or um, human algorithm one. The human and the machine or an algorithm are dependent on one another and can be seen as existing separately. An algorithm would never function without the data that we provide and would never grow in complexity. Controlling an algorithm as part of the system owned by a state or corporation gives a controller immense power. The algorithm in turn helps to enslave those who use it and the enslaved ones enter into a symbiotic relationship with the AI. As Scott Lash argues, power in present times lies in the algorithm which is serving the aims of various corporations as well as governments. An algorithm has become the central infrastructure of global digital economy, the key infrastructure that is instrumental in surveillance capitalism, and it performs the main function of this economy, the production of our digital selves or individuals. AI systems obviously are not negative um, in themselves, Although, as many scholars point out, um, algorithms do seem to be working against humans in aiding um, facial recognition, racial profiling, 
deepening gender-based discrimination and more generally being the key infrastructure of surveillance capitalism, um, without which the system would not function. This system can also be interpreted as a mechanism producing a peculiar transhumanist reality, but not a technological utopia, quite the opposite. Um, transhumanism is a utopian idea that imagines a future where technologies can elevate a human into another evolutionary level, where human suffering could be abolished, illnesses exterminated, life prolonged, and so on. In more concrete terms, such utopianism has um, been often reflected by the technology companies themselves in portraying squarely the positive aspects of their interventions into our everyday life be it the invention of a personal computer, the internet, a metaverse, or algorithmic recommendations. But the truth is that transhumanist utopianism has been fully incorporated into the logic of surveillance capitalism, primarily through the extraction of data uh, using the artificial intelligence algorithms, and the subsequent division of identity into an actual one and a digital one. This technological development anticipates a new concept of the self, a self which is saturated by the non-human. And because such complex um, entanglements um, are the structures um, of power comprised of an undemocratic state apparatus and equally vicious logic of neoliberal, neoliberal capitalism, the transhuman that emerges out of the human machine assemblage in India is nothing but a dystopian reflection of the unfulfilled promises of digital enlightenment. Thank you very much. Uh, we can, yes. So sorry, I was a little bit absent uh, minded. So thank you, uh, Dr. Sharnas, for your uh, insightful talk. Uh, now I open this session uh, to question, answer, and observation uh, from our audience. If there is any question, observation, uh, if you have any kind of query, okay, confusion, uh, Dr. Sharnas will be happy to take you to answer your question. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Sharnas. Thank you for everything. Uh, thank you very much. Respectful lecture, and I just want to tell you one thing that the, this lecture has been recorded, and it will be archived on our CRP YouTube channel. So okay. later on, our audience will be able to watch it on our CRP channel. So thank okay. you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Us, uh, warm regards and much love and peace. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Oh, there is another session. Uh, sorry, there is one question. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, Sarunas, I am reading this. Reading, yes, I'm reading this for you. It's a dystopian state now prevailing in India. What do you predict, sir? Um, well, uh... Unfortunately, I can't predict anything positive. Uh, looking at the tendencies that are, that are um, happening now, um, from the technological standpoint, um, obviously the, the, the technologies will evolve further and uh, they will continue having a um, stronger grip on our existence, our, our everyday life. And given the fact that uh, technologies are in the service of um, various corporations who have their own um, their own agendas uh, in terms of extracting that data. The more data, the, the better. Um, well, there should be some kind of a fundamental uh, shift that um, I would say will liberate these technologies from the control of the corporate sector and um, the government, whether it's um, India's or or any other, because these are all the global processes. And and this well, dystopia is is pretty much global. Um, I mean, I have to say, I don't see a light at the end of the tunnel at um, at this point. I don't see any potential for any. 
uh, let's say, tectonic shifts um, happening uh, in this regard. Dr. Sharanos, thank you uh, for your talk. So hope thank you. Uh, our paths will cross again in future. Uh, sure. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. It was a pleasure.